So in the last few years, there has been this, uh, what I would call a strange teaching, that Christ's uh, second coming is already behind us, and that his thousand-year millennial reign, which we read about in uh, Revelation chapter 20, is already behind us, and that we are living in what's called a short season, or a little season in which Satan, who was bound up at the time of the thousand-year reign, has been let loose, and then he has gone out to deceive the nations. So essentially, we are living in this time period of uh, the post-millennial time, let's put it that way, okay? So I find this truly to be a strange teaching, and I have done many videos on it, which are linked in the description. But again, you know, I keep coming across these people keep, uh, you know, writing to me or asking me about it. So I found uh, this one more video by this uh, by this person. You know, I don't have anything uh, against uh, the person as such. You know, I commend them for, you know, trying to study and to trying to understand scripture. But I believe that, you know, their teaching is an error. So what I thought I would do is I would take some clips which would highlight what is being taught and then I will show what the scriptures actually teach. And then, you know, you yourself can be the judge of this as to what time period you're living in. Now, I mean, personally, I think that the book of Revelation and basically the prophecies of Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, etc., they are all future. Okay, what we call the time of the tribulation it is all a future event which will transpire within a very short period of time, although it's commonly taught that it will be seven years. That is also incorrect. Okay, There are some seven-year periods within the greater period of the tribulation, but I believe the tribulation itself will last closer to 40 years, not seven years. So all these events of uh, you know Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, and the book of Revelation, they will occur, Revelation from chapter 6 into chapter 19, they will transpire over a period of just under 40 years, not quite 40 years, under 40 years, okay? All of them must happen in that time. So they're all in the future yet because I do not believe that, you know, Revelation 6, the opening of the seals is yet complete, although I am of the opinion that the first seal may already have been opened back in 2020. All right, and then I have videos on that as well. So you're more than welcome to go to my channel and, you know, click on the Prophecy playlist and you will find like dozens and dozens of teachings on these topics. So let's begin here to uh, by asking the question, is the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, which is the 1,000 year reign, right here on this very earth, okay? This is not in the new earth that is promised to come. This is right here on this very earth. You know, is that 1,000 year reign an event that is already passed, or is it yet in the future? So the channel I will be referencing is uh, called There's No Place Like Home, and this video is titled Re-Examining the Millennium and Little Season in uh, the interest of you know keeping this within their appropriate copyright laws, etc. I'm going, just going to be taking some clips which highlight what the person is teaching, and uh, then uh, I will put a link in the description for those who might want to go and view the whole video. Hi everyone, I'm Shelly and you're watching There's No Place Like Home. I'm back with another Question the Narrative video and today's topic is Re-examining the Millennium and Little Season. And it's mainly because, you know, I used to be in the camp that believes that we are in the little season right now. And I know that a lot of people don't like when I call it a popular uh, theory. So I won't call it a popular theory. I will say, though, that it is certainly gaining popularity in the truther movement. The idea that the millennial kingdom was, you know, the time that these beautiful Tartarian, what we would call Tartarian um, buildings were built. And that was during the millennial reign of Christ that already happened. And then when Satan was loosed, it caused some sort of reset and that we are living in that short season mentioned in Revelation 20 right now. And that's just basically it in a nutshell. So let's quickly read from Revelation 20 to get an understanding of what is meant by the millennial reign 
and the thousand year period for which Satan was bound or will be bound. And verse 1 it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Okay, So this is the millennial reign of Christ. It's a period of time after his second coming in Revelation chapter 19, where Satan is bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years, and during that thousand years, Christ sets up a kingdom right here on this old earth, because this old earth is going to be destroyed in the future to be replaced by a new earth. But uh, at that time, before that happens, Christ reigns, lives and reigns in this earth a thousand years with his elect. Okay. So what we've been told is that once the thousand years are expired, as we read here in verse 3, uh, and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that he must be loosed a little season. So what we have been told is that this thousand year reign of Christ, his second coming is past and uh, he his thousand year reign is past and after that this is the time period in which Satan has been loosed and he is doing some activity on this earth including causing some very catastrophic destruction called the reset about which I will talk in just one moment. Okay. So let us just go ahead and summarize what uh, Shelley was uh, teaching us okay, and what uh, we can learn from her teachings is that she says that we are now living in a post-millennial time period. Christ's second coming is past, as is his thousand-year reign on this earth. Evidence that was presented are some buildings like European cathedrals and castles associated with a civilization called Tartaria that were allegedly built during Christ's millennial reign. Since Satan has been loosed from the bottomless pit, he has caused great destruction to the world that was built in Christ's thousand-year reign on earth, which is termed a reset. Based on Revelation 23, the present time period is called the little season. Now let us look at uh, these uh, teachings and see if they are actually supported by scripture or not. First of all, let's address the subject of these Tartarian buildings, okay? I don't want to go into this topic of Tartarian, which I have done videos in the past, okay? but. This idea that, you know, these ancient buildings, not these ancient, these older buildings, you know, such as uh, some cathedrals, such as like St. Peter's Basilica or Notre Dame Cathedral, Cathedral in Paris, etc., were built during Christ's millennial reign, is the, it is a ludicrous idea, okay? Because, as you can see, you know, these buildings, they are filled with idolatrous statues and artwork and with occult symbols everywhere, okay? Books have been written about it, movies have been made about this, about this gothic and grotesque architecture and their artwork that is in them. They are devilish to the limit, okay? There are more devils per square inch in these cathedrals than probably are in hell, okay? So to say that these were built during Christ's millennial kingdom, it is really, really not supported by scripture whatsoever. As for example, you can see this picture, you know, like, I mean, they even have an elephant on, on Notre Dame in Paris. You know, what's an elephant doing there? Is there? There's no elephants in France as far as we know. But we know the elephant is a big, uh, you know, it's a big god in India and places like that. So, you know, these are creatures that have been worshipped as gods. It's idolatry. So these idolatrous images are everywhere to say that these buildings are evidence of Christ's millennial rule. I believe, you know, that you should read the Ten Commandments and the first one in particular, which tells us you shall have no other gods before me. And then, you know, that you shall not make any image of any creature or any object that is in heaven or on earth, okay? So if this is what they're filled with, can they have been built in Christ's millennial kingdom? Well, my answer to that would be an emphatic no. So to them, the, the short season, when we think of short, um, 
in human terms, not so short, maybe just like a, a few hundred years long, the, the short season is that, that they're referring to in Revelation 20. Now let's look at this uh, little season or Satan's little season from Revelation chapter 20, verse 3. Well, the best way to understand it, okay, as to uh, what this means is to try and find another scripture that would be similar or the exact term terminology is used to get an idea of what it can mean in context of both the scriptures. So yes, we do have this very term, a little season used somewhere else and is none other than in the book of Revelation itself in chapter 6 verse 11 and what we read there is and white robes are given unto every one of them and it was said unto them that they should rest rest yet for a little season until their fellow, fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled okay and this is again at the time of the fifth seal. We can read in verse 9, When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony in which they held. So there is these souls, these people, these believers that have been martyred, and they are under the altar of God in heaven. So they cry out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, does that not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So they are asking for vengeance for the shedding of their blood. And what is the answer they get? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season. Okay, So these words, these two words, little and season, the little word is the Greek word micros. Okay, It means puny. It means like minuscule. It is like almost like an instant of time. That is what that really means. Okay, This word is G3398 in uh, the Greek and the Strong's concordance, and it's the word micros. That's where we get micro, you know, microscope, or uh, micro something is very small, we call it micro, okay? So apparently, uh, small in size, in quantity, in number, or in, you could say, in time, okay? So this is what this word micros mean. It means something that is very small. It's not like hundreds and hundreds of years long. And season, season is again chronos, it's just a period of time. So what we are told is, yes, it's a period of time, but it's a very, very small period of time. Now, when we look at Revelation chapter 6, okay, and uh, in the opening of the seals, where people teach that the, all the events of Revelation, the tribulation from chapter 6 unto Revelation chapter 19 are only going to last seven years. Okay? If they are only going to last seven years, and it's a little season, it's just a very minor part, of time in there, right? It's not the whole seven years that they're told to rest. It is just a little bit more time, okay? But even if it is seven years, then that's what uh, a little season would mean. Now, I'm of the understanding that the tribulation is not seven years, it's closer to 40 years. So you could say that a little season means 40 years and no more, okay? So when it's 40 years or seven years in one case, why would it suddenly mean hundreds of years? Why would we be led to believe that you know, Christ's uh, millennial reign came to an end hundreds of years ago in the 1600s, 1700s or something, and since that Satan has been running around, you know, causing, destroying everything in his path, and, uh, and that is why this is Satan's little season. Now I'm going to address the subject of what happens to Satan after he is loosed. Does he really go around and cause any type of destruction, any type of war at all? according to scripture, and you will find that the answer is no, he does not. So in my opinion, this little season is a period of time which is no more than 40 years, at the most. That's what it means, okay? So again, to teach that, you know, this is Satan's little season, it's lasting hundreds and hundreds of years, I do not believe there's any scripture that can support such, as in, such an interpretation. First of all, point number one is that, to my knowledge, there are no verses in the Bible that describe an earthly millennial kingdom. So this lady tells us that she does not see anywhere in scripture that Christ's millennial 1,000 year reign will be on this very earth, okay? Well, let's just examine that claim, okay? First of all, we understand that Christ is going to return to this earth. The second coming is to this earth. His feet are going to land in the Mount of Olives and Mount of Olives is going to spread into two, etc. We know that, right? In Revelation 19, he comes to the earth and he destroys the armies of the Antichrist. And then there, you know, the flesh of these captains, etc., is fed to the fowl of the air. 
and that also happens right here on the earth. But, you know, let's look at this here, what we are told. Okay, that uh, I saw the souls of him that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, etc. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Where do they live and reign for, with him? Okay. And uh, continuing on into verse 7, when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Okay, Satan is loosed out of his prison. And where does he go? And he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog. Where are nations? They are on the earth. Okay. So where is he going to go and deceive them? On the earth. To gather them to battle, together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth. Okay. Where did they go? Breadth of the earth. What did they do? They compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. So where is the camp of the saints? Where is the beloved city? It's on the earth, right? And that makes sense, no? That Satan is going to be doing this on the earth. He's not going to go up in heaven and all those souls that have already been martyred, that are already in heaven, that have already been saved, he's not going to be able to go and deceive them up in heaven, right? It has to be on the earth. And it tells us that. It repeats that more than once, that, you know, he should go out and deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. And if these nations are on the four quarters of the earth, that Satan is going to deceive then is this millennial kingdom also not on the earth moreover this evidence of this millennial kingdom when they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints and the beloved city where are they they are right here on the earth what is the beloved city it is most likely jerusalem from which christ is going to reign on this very earth for a thousand years that's a very important reason why he has to reign here before we get into the eternity into the eternal kingdom into the new heaven and the new earth uh, but I'm not, I will not go into that here. But then you can look at verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on him, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. We know that, you know, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth coming. So till what time does this earth last? Till the thousand years are expired. So what happened during those thousand years? Christ's kingdom was right here on this earth. So, you know, to say... That the Bible, there's no evidence in it that uh, Christ's millennial kingdom is not going to be on the earth. I would beg to differ very, very strongly. Well, thanks to Bob Cruikshank, I understand now that new heaven and new earth in Isaiah 65 and 66 is actually referring to the heaven and earth. Now, remember, this is symbolic language that they use in, in prophecies. The heaven and earth of chapter 65 and 66 is referring to after the Babylonian exile. Remember audience relevance? It is, it is still important in Isaiah 65 and 66. So that was specifically about after the Babylonian exile. And then yes, it is a typology for what is going to happen in Revelation 21 after it was fulfilled ultimately in Christ. But the point that I originally was making was that it is not about the millennial kingdom that so many people like to point towards with it. There is a lot of this kind of teaching, especially in regard to the book of Revelation, that it is symbolic and not literal. Okay, as far as I understand, the whole Bible is literal, right from Genesis through to Revelation. Moreover, it is in chronological order, the Bible itself and also the book of Revelation. So this idea that the uh, reference to a new heaven and a new earth is merely symbolic or even as this person, you know, says it's hyperbole, I think it is absolutely incorrect. Because we can read, you know, for example, in Isaiah 66, it says, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, so saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. So, I mean, you know, this reference to new heavens and the new earth, and also to the new city of heaven, the new Jerusalem, it is found in numerous places in the Bible. So to just say that this is all allegorical, it is not correct. Okay, in 2 Peter 3.10, you know, it's, it describes vividly as to how this present creation is going to pass away. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. 
So, you know, when it's that, uh, the description is that clear, like how we can say that is uh, merely a, a symbolic or allegorical, I do not understand, okay? And then uh, in verse 13, in Second Peter 3, verse 13, it says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwell righteousness. And why? Why do we think that this must happen? Why is this earth and these heavens need to pass away? As I've taught in many of my teachings, you know, as to that this whole creation is a temporary one. This is not the eternal creation. The eternal is yet to come. The eternal, which is meant for the eternal children, the eternal sons of God, is as a place which is going to be one, which is not contaminated, which is not polluted, just as the inhabitants of that new creation are going to be perfected, are being perfected in this age. They are going to be perfected in righteousness. Their conscience is going to be pure, like that of their maker. So too must their abode, the new heaven and the new earth, also be uncontaminated, not defiled. And how do we know that this earth and these heavens are defiled? You know, we can read in uh, Genesis chapter 4 in regards to the story of Cain and Abel, on which I'm doing a teaching right now, is in 4, chapter 4, I believe it's verse 11. It says, Now, and now thou art cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. Okay, this earth, since that time of Cain, it has seen much, much bloodshed, okay? So because it has seen this bloodshed, this uh, the ground is literally, oceans of blood have been spilled on it. This earth is not, is not suitable for the new creatures in Christ to be their home. Their home is going to be the new Jerusalem on the new earth, which is going to be the place wherein dwells righteousness. Moreover, the man who was formed of the dust of the ground of this very earth shed the blood of his maker on this very earth. Therefore, this earth is polluted. It is covered in blood. And therefore, it is not a suitable habitation for those who are the new creatures in Christ. Those who are going to be the family of the Creator, for them God has promised, as we read in Second Peter 3, that He has promised them a new heavens and a new earth, which is sure to come. Moreover, we can read, for example, in Isaiah 66, you know, where he talks about that the, the new heavens and the earth which I shall make. Okay, in Genesis 1-1, we read, you know, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. We know that the heaven and the earth that he created is very literal. It's a real place. So when he says in Isaiah 66, you know, the new heavens and the earth which I shall make, why is that taken symbolically? Why is that also not literal like the first heaven and the first earth were not just symbolic, they are real places. Why won't the new heavens and the new earth also be real places? That a question, that's a question you all should ask yourself. The heavens themselves are not clean. These present heavens are not clean in God's eyes. We can read that in Job 15, 15. Behold, he putteth no trust in his saints. Yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. Therefore, this creation, because it has been contaminated by evil, it must be burnt away, just like evil is going to be ultimately condemned to the lake of fire, so too must this creation be destroyed by fire so that the new one can come in. Therefore, no, I do not agree with this interpretation that this teaching is, is merely symbolic and it is not literal. The whole Bible is literal. The book of Revelation is a very, very literal book. All the things that are written in it and described in it, they are going to happen as, uh, as written. You know, the Bible does use symbolism, does talk in parables that Jesus taught many times in parables. But when it does, it tells us that this is a parable, okay, that this is, this, this is something, this teaching is like an allegory that is being used to teach something to bring a greater truth to our understanding. It does not, you know, it, it tells us when it is a parable, when, it is a, when the symbolism is being used. So we don't have to look for that everywhere in the Bible. Where it is, it tells us itself. Otherwise, it is to be taken literally. Another interesting point that I wanted to make is that the term a thousand years or millennium is only used in this context in Revelation 20. It is not used anywhere else in the Bible in reference to this time. 
And this time period, like I mentioned before, is alluded to in the Gospels and in the, the epistles, yet the term a thousand years is never mentioned. I think just because of the fact that uh, the thousand years may not directly be mentioned somewhere else is really not of much importance whatsoever. It does not change its meaning, doesn't change it into allegory, doesn't mean that it is not literal, it is not just figurative, okay? Because there are many things in the Bible and many places that are mentioned only once. And in regards to the book of Revelation, as I've thought many times, you know, Matthew 24, for example, is like a little summary, okay? It's a synopsis but the book of Revelation fills in all the details. So all those details may not be found in the Gospels, but they are found in the book of Revelation. There are many other things in the book of Revelation that are not seen anywhere else. And even, for example, the beginning, you know, where we see Jesus coming in this glorious, you know, his uh, appearance, for example, the, the fact about the 24 elders that are sitting around the throne of God and the beasts that are also around the throne of God. We have not, we did not read anywhere else about the four horsemen of the apocalypse or about the, you know, sealing of the 12 tribes, uh, the seven trumpets, the seven vials. We do not read anywhere else about this locust army that is going to be coming out of the earth and uh, about the two witnesses or even about, you know, the time of the beast and his mark or about uh, the whore of Babylon or the destruction of Babylon the Great. You know, there's so much in there that is only found in the book of Revelation. So to pick and uh, choose, you know, one to try and fit an interpretation, it, in my belief, is not the correct way of understanding the Bible and the book of Revelation in particular. It's thought that this verse is actually talking about this little season is referring to the time of the siege on Jerusalem. And that is why there are many people now who believe that the little season here is actually the little season of Revelation 20. So the little season of Revelation 20 is specifically talking about the siege on Jerusalem. And we will get into that in this video also. Uh, so what this person is teaching here is that this little season mentioned in Revelation chapter 6 verse 11 which reads, And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Okay. So this person is telling us that this verse, uh, this uh, phrase, a little season, it is referring to the time of Satan being uh, let loose out of the bottomless pit for a after the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. And it's that's, uh, we are told that he'll be, in uh, Revelation 20 verse 3, that he will be let loose for a little season, that this is that time. However, we can see in Revelation chapter 7, that right after this chapter, that this, what they were told to do, it was already happened. That the people that they were waiting for that should be killed, they are killed and they are already there in heaven. They don't arrive there a thousand years after Christ's reign at the time of after the millennial, etc. No, that happens right during the tribulation. So the way we understand this is that the group in Revelation 6 is the group of martyrs, the people that have been killed for the name of God and Jesus Christ all throughout history. They are before the altar of God. And then they are told that, you know, yes, we're entering the time of tribulation now. And in this time, there's going to be a lot more people that are going to be killed. Just as Jesus himself taught in Matthew 24, you know, for example, that, you know, you shall be killed for my name's sake, you know, you shall be hated by all nations, etc. So he says, yeah, it's those group in that tribulation, they are going to be killed. And then when they have joined you here, after that will come the time of your vengeance which takes place, of course, in Revelation chapter 19. Okay, so in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, we read, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes. What did we read in Revelation 6, 11? And white robes were given unto every one of them. So this group in Revelation 7, not in Revelation 20, is the same that these ones in Revelation 6:11 were told to wait for. 
And in Revelation 7.13 we can read, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? See, white robes again, to identify them with the group that had come before them, the group of martyrs that had come before the tribulation. Now these are the ones that are coming out of the great tribulation. And in verse 14, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So yes, this is not referring, this little season that they were asked to wait for is not the time of the millennial. This was the time of the tribulation. They were told, just rest yet. You've been resting for a while. Rest a little while longer until your fellow servants and your brethren that are going to be killed like you have been, they are going to come out of this great time of great tribulation. So that is how we understand this. Not that, you know, it has no connection to the little season of Satan in Revelation chapter 20. So now I've not included this clip, but you know, this person is teaching that the millennial means 40 years, okay? That uh, somehow the ministry of Jesus or the time from Jesus' ministry till the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, uh, let's say from AD 30 unto AD 70 or something like that, was 40 years that is the period of the millennial reign that satan was bound by jesus after he was tempted by him okay when jesus when satan tempted jesus that you know after the temptation satan was bound up okay and then he was bound for 40 years or something which somehow equals a thousand years okay so i don't want to go into much detail about that but this teaching about Satan being bound by Jesus in the time of the days of his flesh, you know, it is like so patently false and disproven by scripture that I don't even know how people can teach it, okay? And as far as the millennial reign is concerned, okay, the thousand years that you know, equated with Jesus' ministry, when the Jesus himself came, okay, to dictate the book of Revelation to the Apostle John, the book of Revelation was probably not written till long after AD 70. Some people believe that it was written around AD 90 or 95, okay? Long after Jerusalem had been destroyed, the temple had been destroyed because the Apostle John lived to be a very long age, an old age, okay? In Revelation 1 1, we can read the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. So, this is long after Jesus' earthly ministry. He's come. He's dictating this book. He's showing John these, uh, you know, prophecies of what is to come. And included in that is the thousand-year reign and the time of thousand-year binding of Satan. So, to say that, you know, somehow Satan was bound by Jesus, that, which means that Satan was not active in the time of Jesus' ministry, which is obviously a falsehood, yet people claim that. Okay, so I'll show you some more here. Luke, thir Luke uh, uh, 4.13, I believe it tells us. Yeah, Luke 4.13. And when the devil had ended, ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Okay, so it doesn't look like to me that, you know, Jesus bound Satan here somehow. He tells us that Satan left. Satan tempted him. Jesus, you know, rebuked him and Jesus, Satan left. And that, you know, have, have the devils. Did they all leave or they were bound up somehow? No. In Mark 5, for example, we can read, when near about the madman of Gadara, it says, For he said unto him, Come out of thou, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for me are many. So, you know, here in this one instant, there was a whole legion of devils that were right there. In Luke 13, 16, And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, who Satan, whom Satan has bound, Lo, these 18 years. So Satan was there binding people right when Jesus was around. Okay, he's keeping them bound. So Satan himself was bound by Jesus. How was he doing this binding? And in Luke 22, 3, then entered Satan into Judas. So if Satan is bound. How is he entering into Judas? Do you understand that these teachings, honestly to me, they make no sense. Yet people are teaching them, especially in regards to this, that, you know, somehow that we are living in the post-millennial time? No, it's yet in the future, my friends. And in Luke 7, 21, in that same hour he cured many of the infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits. 
So when he's curing them of infirmities and diseases, you know, this is not allegorical, it's real. So were these evil spirits that he was casting out of people. And then to many that were blind, he gave sight. And then, of course, you know, all throughout the New Testament, we are told that Satan is active. We read in Ephesians 6.12, for example, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers, the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Oh, they're very active. And somebody say that Satan has been bound. And what happened after he was bound, he was unbound. So they say, okay, after Jesus' ministry ended or AD 70, whatever, Satan was let loose. Well, if he was let loose in AD 70, and since then, you know what, some 2,000 years have gone by. So, you know, is he still, wasn't he supposed to be bound only for a thousand years, which was a 40 years? Do you see how confusing these teachings become? For when you take them literally, and take them to mean what exactly is written, then they're simple. The words are plain, and there's no room for any false interpretations. Peter said, you know, your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion. This is after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection that Peter's writing this year. He's saying the devil is still in this world, and people teach you, oh, I saw hell, Satan is lightning fall from heaven. Yes, that's going to happen in Revelation 12 when we get to those days. He is still very much the prince of the power of the air. He is operating in the heavenly realms and on this earth at this very moment. No, he was not bound by Jesus during the days of his ministry. He has been loose, you know, he is free you know, in, a, in this world, to operate in this world, all during the time of Jesus' ministry, all during the time of the apostles, and unto the day that he is finally going to be cast into, the, at least, you know, thrown into the bottomless pit for a thousand years and then cast into the lake of fire. So these teachings that, you know, that somehow this period of 40 years in the first century equals the thousand year millennial reign, no, I don't buy that. And secondly, that, you know, Satan was bound by Jesus during the days of his ministry. No, the Bible doesn't support that in any way, shape, or form. Therefore, you know, we ought to go by what scriptures teach, not by what man teaches. So if you look at this passage, Satan is bound from harming Job. But he is certainly has license to do many other things in this context. So this person continues uh, this teaching that uh, the binding of Satan means that his activities are restricted. That he is still free, but he's only restricted from doing certain things. And then uh, she gives the example of Job, in which Satan was allowed to afflict Job up to a certain extent, but he did not have a free reign. However, is that what Revelation chapter 20 means? When we look at Revelation, let's read from verse 1. It says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit. So it's the bottomless pit is what? It's a prison. It has a door. It has a key. Which we can also read in Revelation chapter 9, you know, where the, the angel opens the bottomless pit. And uh, then these uh, angels that are, that are bound up in it, uh, in that pit, are able to escape out of it then and then only. And that is what we are told here, that, you know, he has got the key. So obviously there's a lock on it. And once the lock is shut, the person is locked up inside. They are not free to act, as Satan was in the case of Job. Yes, he was restricted in his activities, but he was not bound in the case of Job. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Now, okay, there was no chain laid upon Satan in the case of Job. So not only... Is he going to be thrown into the bottomless pit? He is going to be chained in there, okay? So is he free to do certain things as this person is teaching? And again, you know, I'm not including any more clips from it. You can go and listen to the teaching yourself, whoever wants to. But I mean, uh, just, these are just examples I'm giving of how far-fetched these interpretations can become when we leave the plain words of Scripture and we try to rest them, to twist them, to make them to mean something, to fit our doctrines or our theologies rather than what God is teaching us in plain English. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. What is the word bound? It's G1210. To bind, literally or figuratively, bind, be in bonds, 
to knit, to tie, to bind, to tie, to fasten, to bind, to fasten with chains, to throw into chains. Well, did this angel have a chain? So is he going to bind this devil with chains? So once the devil is bound with chains, thrown into the bottomless pit and locked up, do you think he was free to go around and do anything? And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. What? Cast him, threw him into the pit, chained him, threw him in there, and what? Shut him up. Shut him up how? By sealing that door. Does he seal that door? Does he lock it and seal it? And set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. So in this case of Job, which example is being given, it does not apply here because in the case of Job, Satan was still free to wander up and down in the earth, to walk to and fro through it. And he was told, okay, yes, God placed some boundaries upon what he could do with Job and what he couldn't do, but that didn't mean that Satan himself was bound up. No, not at all. So that example does not apply to Revelation 23, which this person is trying to do. Till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be, what? Loosed. So he was in chains, he was bound, he was locked, he was sealed, and then he would be taken out of the pit. So again, the meaning of being bound and being loosed is quite plain. Being bound means that you know, Satan was thrown into a prison. Being loosed means he was taken out of the prison. That's it. The story of Job is about the restriction that is God places upon Satan's powers and activities. Two different teachings, two so that the, these these things, you know, Job 20 to say that you know, uh, Revelation 20 verse 3 or verse 2 means that being bound is to place a restriction on Satan's activities when the words and terminology used clearly indicates that he is not free to do anything whatsoever. You know, it does not. That is a gross twisting a scripture in my opinion he is he is reigning now okay that's what i believe that we are already beyond the, we are in the new heavens and new earth right now because it simply means new covenant and i have talked about that in other videos but i want to share with you some verses that certainly seem to support that there's it's not a physical kingdom john eighteen thirty six says jesus answered my kingdom is not of this world if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. He said that twice. See, this teaching that we already in the new heavens and the new earth, what can I say? In Revelation 21, 27, we read, And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defiles, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie. I think in this world there are plenty of abominations, there are plenty of lies, there's plenty of things that defile. So obviously, if it were the new heaven and the new earth, none of these things should exist any longer. Secondly, to always teach, you know, that the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God is only a spiritual, you know, then, uh, but God himself said, you know, I have made a body for myself. He literally said that, that, you know, sacrifice and offering thou did not desire, but a body has thou prepared for me. The whole purpose of this creation is for God to replicate, to reproduce, to, to image himself, copy himself in a, in a body, to become flesh, okay, to become a corporeal being, or at least to replicate or reproduce himself in corporeal form. That is the purpose, and that requires something that is real and tangible, something that is material, not just spiritual. So God is spirit, and he is spiritual, but he has come to dwell in a body. That requires a physical, a, a place that is also one that is not just what you might call air, but is actually made like the new heaven, made out of these precious stones, etc., of materials, it is a material heaven, okay? It's made out of something that is tangible. See, we ourselves are called the body of Christ, and that is not the spirit of Christ, which we also have, but we dwell in a body. So this body requires a tangible 
a real place, a real earth, a real heaven. And I can see, I can look around, I know I'm not in the new heaven or the new earth, okay? No, it's not. So to say that it's never going to be something that is going to be uh, 100% coming, that is a real place, it is not biblical. And the Bible, like I said, is very literal. And the time is going to come when this whole creation is going to burn up and it is going to be replaced by the new heavens and the new earth, just as God has promised, in which will dwell, will dwell the body of Christ, who are his sons and his his family, which are physical creatures. That is God in the flesh. That's what God has prepared, and that will require a tangible creation, not just something that is spiritual or allegorical. When Jesus, when she quoted John 18.36, you know, in John 18.36 we read, and Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. That's all he's saying. That, you know, where did he come from? He came from heaven. Where was he the king of? The heaven. Who was the king in this world? It was given to Adam who handed to Satan. He's the god of this world. There's a world that is evil and corrupt and abominable, and God is going to destroy it. He did not want to be ruling and railing over this world. Okay, if my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from hence. That doesn't mean that he didn't have a kingdom that was real and tangible. But it was not just this one on this earth. That's all. So to just to allegorize it or to just spiritualize it, you know, it means nothing that's tangible. No, that is not what uh, is being taught here. So I will end this shortly. But before I do, I want to, uh, you know, address this subject again about this uh, kingdom of God being within us. Okay. This is taken from Luke, okay, in Luke 17, 20 we read, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, he was demanded, remember that, okay, when the kingdom of God should come. So basically they were like trying to disprove his teachings. They were questioning him. They were not believers. They were, they were trying to prove him wrong, okay. So when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered and said unto them, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo, here or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. What this means is that he is telling these Pharisees that unless God, the kingdom of God is observed, it is discerned spiritually first. But that doesn't mean that there is not going to be a real, like, you know, there is a real heaven right now about which we can read extensively in the Bible, especially in the book of Revelation. There is a real throne of God there right now. There is a real throne of Jesus, who is God in the flesh, who sits at the right hand of God, who is a spirit. These are doctrinal subjects, very important ones, as to why God replicated or reproduced himself in bodily form. We are told in the case of Jesus, then him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In, in Genesis 126, we read, let us make man in our image, okay? And then we can read, for example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and other places in Colossians chapter 1, that Jesus is the image of God. In Hebrews 1, 3, we are told he is the express image of God, which means that he is an exact clone, a copy of God the Father, and exact the same person as God the Father, although they're two, yet they're one. But one of them is in bodily form. In Luke, we can read, I'll show you the scripture where he said, when he appeared to his disciples, he said, a spirit has not flesh and bone, like you see me have, okay? God the Father does not have flesh and bone because he is spirit. But the Son of God does, he is God, yet he does have flesh and bone. Anything that is flesh, the earth was made for man. Okay, why? Because anybody that is a that has a body requires a tangible, physical place to dwell in. So that kingdom, like it is up in heaven right now, it is a real place. It is not even a spiritual place. It's a very tangible place, just like as the new heavens and the new earth are going to be. 
But let me get back to this scripture from Luke 17, where they tell us, you know, that the kingdom of God is within you. So what he was teaching these Pharisees, you know, you mockers, first you've got to have God living within you, then you shall be able to discern when and where this kingdom of God is going to come. But unless you have, unless you have faith, you cannot see the kingdom of God with your physical eyes. You can only see it with your spiritual eyes. But that does not mean that it is not a real physical place or it's going to be a real kingdom on the physical earth. That is not what that means, okay? And then he went on to answer that question, as a matter of fact, as to when his kingdom was going to come, okay, right here on the earth. And he said unto the disciples in verse 22, the days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And they shall say to you, see here, or see there, go not after them, nor follow them. What are the people going to be telling? That this is the king, this is the kingdom, this is where it is. He said, no. For as the lightning, the lighted out of one part under heaven, shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall the Son of Man be in his day. That is when he said, when you see me up in the sky, when the heaven will depart as a scroll, you shall see the sign of the Son of Man up in the sky. You sh every eye shall see him. He will be coming in his glory with his holy angels. He is coming to set up his kingdom right here on the earth. That is when the kingdom of God is going to come to this earth. So for these people to teach that the kingdom of God and we are already in the new heaven and the new earth, you know, it leaves me speechless because it is patently false. God has reproduced himself in bodily form. He is going to make a real physical place. That new heaven is going to be a real building. It is going to be with the streets of gold and all this, the, the, the jewels and the precious stones that it is going to be built of. There is going to be a new earth in which will dwell righteousness. That is going to come. We are not in that. We are still in this first earth. We are still the last enemy, which is death, has not yet been destroyed. All prophecy has not yet been fulfilled. We are not into Revelation chapter 20 yet. Okay? Please don't be deceived by these teachings. So, I'm going to finish this here, and uh, then I will continue this in one more part, and I think after that I'm pretty much going to be done with this. So I will have done at least five or six teachings on this topic, but I would encourage you to go do your own studies, and if you have questions, you can email me, you know, contact me. I will try and answer them for you as best as I can. Okay, well, thank you for listening. This is Paul Sandhu. Mm -hmm.